All right, what's up, everybody? We are back with another special edition of the Occupy Fantasy Football Podcast. I am Brian Jester, your co-founder and co-host here at Occupy Fantasy. Today, we're bringing on another guest. This time, I'm joined by PFF's Andrew Erickson. What's happening, Andrew? Brian, what's up, my man? It's been a while since we've seen each other, saw each other in Las Vegas. And look, I'm going to be honest with you, Brian. I've only met you one time, and I think that we've actually met you know, that time that we met in Vegas is probably more recent than I've met some of my actual, you know, extended family. So uh, it's been a while, but uh, not really as much as you think. Dude, I know. It's kind of crazy. It, you know, that was over a year ago. FSGA. Uh, for those who don't know, FSGA is the, the yearly or, or uh, semi-annual conference, the Fantasy Sports Association, uh, where all the industry writers and who's who of the fantasy industry get together and network and talk about things and mostly just drink and hang out for a couple of days. This past year's was in Vegas. We haven't had one since because of the pandemic, but uh, Andrew, I think your story was, was awesome. I, and when I met you out there, you weren't in fantasy full time. You literally put the money down. And for those who've never been, it's, it's, it's kind of an expensive trip, not only to pay to go to Vegas, but to also pay for the conference fees itself. You were looking to get into the industry and hell it worked. Yeah, man, I really wanted to become a full-time analyst for football, whether it was for, you know, any company that would hire me full-time. I really just wanted to get myself out there and going to business school, you know, graduating with a marketing degree. You know, one of the things that people kept telling me was like, hey, Andrew, it doesn't matter what you know how to do, it matters who you know. And that was a recurring theme with even the couple of the full-time jobs I got outside of after I graduated from college working in a digital marketing agency actually worked for two marketing agencies one was in-house and basically that's how i got all those jobs is because my sister knew this guy <laughs> and i had a connection with this player this person here and then at the fsg i'm like hey it's the same thing you know i'm gonna go introduce myself gonna meet these people hand out my business cards and it's like whatever if i can't get you know 10 15 people you know reject me it's like it, you just need one to hit and you know someone that i met there obviously I met you brian and you were super helpful we, we got the, we got the chance to talk about a lot of different things and i remember it's funny because it was jet ratcliffe from pff that I actually got to talk to a lot and eventually that's kind of that was kind of my connection that got me into pff and it's funny this is a true story for everyone listening you know the last message that brian sent me before we reconnected to get on the show here is literally the job application to the job i now have at pff <laughs> You're welcome, I guess. Right? No, I, I mean, you put in the hard work, and that was an incredible story. Uh, nice little bow on the end there with uh, uh, that, that job posting. But So you're now a full-time fantasy analyst for PFF, Pro Football Focus. I, I think a lot of uh, people that will listen to this will know what Pro Football Focus is. Um, so that's, I mean, that's really cool that you have that job now. And the role you play at PFF, I think, is, is a really important role because PFF has tons of data. Literally every NFL team subscribes to PFF in some way or another. And you're able to take all this data and turn it into fantasy analysis because a lot of the data is either behind a paywall or not even accessible to some people. But can you tell us your role at PFF, how you use that data and how it's beneficial to play in DFS? So I try to take out a lot of the noise when it comes to all of this data because Right now, we have so much data at our hands from analysis standpoint, whether it's, you know, the air yards or the target share, everything in between. We're trying to really figure out, you know, what's important, what's not, what can we weigh? And again, there's a little bit that goes into every type of analysis that you can do, especially in fantasy football. But it's our job, you know, myself and Ian, who are the two like main full time employees when it comes to the fantasy side of things, we're trying to figure out, OK, how can we use this as actionable data and so some of the big things that we do in, at PFF, the claim to fame is basically looking at every single play. And that's the thing that I don't think a lot of people still understand is, you know, we take the film work out of what you have to do. So with a PFF subscription, basically we're making it so you don't need to go back and watch all the games. You know, the, the grades are based on people watching the game. So when people get confused, they're like, why is this grade like this? It's be actually because... No, like we've watched all the games, like someone has gone down and done the grades. So again, the grades are subjective in some way, shape or form because it's based on somebody watching the game. And you can have a, a couple of people watch a game at the same time and people can have different takeaways from that game. But some of the cool things that we do in, in the grades is factoring plays that aren't in the stat sheets. So a lot of times, you know, anyone that will watch film will often bring up 
oftentimes bring up the fact, oh, well, you know, this play got called back because of due to penalty, but this, you know, receiver was wide open for, you know, a 60 yard touchdown and it's not on the stat sheet. So any Joe Schmo who looks at the stat sheet, looks at the targets necessarily won't see that play, but PFF makes sure, makes sure to include those types of things in the analysis where no, that player does get credit for that 60 yard touchdown they caught, even though there was a, you know, a holding penalty that had nothing to do with the play whatsoever. Like that doesn't hurt the player that actually helps the player in that same essence. So they get credited for all the plays they make, whether they actually happen or not, or are actually in the stat sheet. Yeah. And that's a really important thing because one, it's availability bias for a lot of people who play DFS, play fantasy football, the information that's available to them, they weigh more heavily in their minds than the the information that they can't see. And not every person, in fact, most people can't watch every single play of every single game, let alone analyze it in an unbiased factor. What's most impressive to me, at least according to all the mentions on Twitter, is that somehow every fan base thinks you guys are biased against them, which I, I think is probably the ultimate testament to that there is no bias because every fan base hates you. So that's, that's pretty impressive in my eyes. No, that makes sense. I know that we had a lot of hate for, for Josh Allen early on, and he obviously had a spectacular season this year. Josh Allen wasn't a player I was particularly low on entering the season, you know, kind of, and that's kind of the other thing, you know, I'm looking at everything from a fantasy point fantasy perspective in a fantasy football point of view which is a little bit different from oh well this team is dumb because they're not doing the optimal strategy of building a, a team whereas i'm looking at it as like hey no i'm looking at more at okay how does this impact fantasy where can i find leverage points in terms of you know ownership in terms of dfs matchups that i could expose and that's where we can really dive into the weeds with some of the things that pff that that we have access to especially the analysts and then we then put that type of information into the articles that we make to really help give people an idea of, Hey, you know, I think this is actually a strong matchup based on, you know, instead of just looking at a team's run defense overall, okay, well we can break it down by run scheme. You know, how does this team do against a specific scheme? And the same thing goes for when we look at, you know, man versus zone coverages. Again, that's something that's kind of newer looking at that type of thing when it comes to passing quarterbacks, because we always know like, Hey, this defense sucks, but then there's always those random games where, you know, it's a bad defense and the quarterback doesn't hit. And, and we're really kind of looking around. We're like, why didn't they hit? And then you kind of look at the man versus zone coverage. Like, oh, they play a lot of man. They play a lot of zone. And sometimes that can really make make a difference. Yeah, definitely. And I think these newer areas are where edges are to be had in DFS, right? Ev- everyone has access to the the usual uh, metrics now, right? I put that in air quotes. But like the, the, the usual advanced <laughs> metrics, air yards and things like that. It's that next level of data. Um, and I think like, you know, not to get too into the weeds here, but like heat mapping of where different passes go in the field and where different mm-hmm. runs are, are directed. And I think a lot of that, at least high level DFS players, I think if they can use that to their advantage. And again, it's one of those things where you don't necessarily have to be super accurate with what it means. But if you're the one of the first people to use it, that's an edge to you. So all right, enough about PFF, enough about uh, your story, enough about our meeting. I, let's let's talk about what the people are here for. So we're going to talk about Super Bowl, Chiefs, and the Bucks, and two particular high-level topics that we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about some of these underlying metrics for the Super Bowl and what it means for various players. And then secondarily, we're going to put it all together at the end of this episode with some specific showdown strategy. So, Andrew, I think one of the biggest things that um, we can we can look at for DFS is chasing high value opportunities, and we've heard this defined in different ways by different sites, different people. But deep targets, end zone targets, carries near the goal line, and expected fantasy points are, th- are I think are some of the biggest uh, expected or, or high value opportunities. What are your thoughts on in some of these areas for for players for the Super Bowl? Right. You hit the nail on the head. Those are the things that I've been looking at all season long, looking at, you know, targets downfield targets in the end zone. And that's really what a lot of my analysis has been at doing DFS types of articles. You know, I wrote an article every single week this year, just kind of reciting the, you know, who saw the most high value opportunities and basically who didn't hit on them, you know, who was kind of left empty um, at the end of the day when it came to fantasy points, but the opportunities was there. And, and look, this is a, look, it doesn't always hit, you know, chasing the high value opportunities, but oftentimes it does. And again, you can throw, you know, random players in a lineup and you can hit, it, it's definitely possible, but you'd rather have a process that you've done before and actually has proven to work in some circumstances. So that's what I've done a lot of times. I know, I know Marvin Jones, I hit on a couple of times this season because of the high value opportunities. So he was really up and down, but I made sure I didn't miss any of his big weeks that he had 
um, for the Detroit Lions. So for this specific matchup, so we'll start looking at deep targets. And one player that really popped out to me from last week was Mike Evans. So Mike Evans had five deep targets last week, which was more than any other player saw. And that's a huge mismatch. And that's a huge thing to point out because we're trying to figure out which one of these Bucks receivers is going to you know, have a productive game because chances are there's really only going to be one productive Bucks wide receiver due to the fact that the Chiefs have a really good pass defense in terms of giving up fantasy points to the wide receiver position. You know, I tried diving into the weeds to try to figure out, you know, do they have a, you know, are they weak against slot receivers? Are they weak against out wide, outside wide receivers? And really, they're really good against both. Like, there really isn't one crucial factor of this Chiefs defense that just screams, oh, like, this is, you know, the, the matchup. This is the one you have to expose. They really are pretty balanced across the board. So, again, when you're looking at the defense, if you're not finding any matchups to expose necessarily on the defensive side of the football, you need to look, okay, well, we need to look at the offense first. You know, who is Brady going to try to target in this matchup? And for me, I'm looking at Mike Evans. Again, I mentioned the five deep targets last week. He only caught one deep target. And if you watched the game last week, again, a lot of people got the chance to watch the games because there was only a couple on. Um, yeah, Brady was just basically like heaving it up to Mike Evans like all the time. Like he was just like, whatever, just like throwing it downfield to Mike Evans. But that shows you the kind of trust that he has in a guy like Mike Evans. And look, Brady's in the Super Bowl. Like he's going to go to the guy he trusts the most. And in this, in this scenario, I think that we're going to see a lot of Mike Evans deep targets. And the the Buccaneers can be, or excuse me, the Chiefs can be beat downfield. It, it's definitely possible. So I, I like Mike Evans a lot from a deep targets perspective. And he's someone that's just seeing a ton of air yards. He actually has the most air yard share over since week 15. I believe, yeah, highest percentage of team air yards since week 15, 30% air yard share. So he's seeing all the juicy targets down the field. Chris Goblin is obviously still involved out of the slot, but if I'm going to have to decide between one guy, I think that Mike Evans is ultimate the play here because he also sees a really high percentage of end zone targets as well. And the thing with end zone targets is a little bit different than red zone targets is end zone targets are actually going to turn into touchdowns. Like it's a guarantee. Like if you catch an end, a target in the end zone, it is going to be a touchdown. It's not a red zone target, which Again, the correlation is not always there that red zone targets don't always turn into touchdowns. So that's something that we do at PFF. We have a, a red zone kind of opportunities chart. And the thing about it is it just clearly defines what an end zone target is versus a red zone target. So it's a little bit different. And you'll find that the end zone targets are actually much more valuable than the red zone targets because those, again, don't always turn into touchdowns, whereas the end zone targets, uh, they do. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people are going to have that decision point. Chris Godwin versus Mike Evans and all their showdown lineups. There may be a couple lineups out there, a small percentage that play both of them, and it's likely with a, a Tom Brady captain or Tom Brady in the flex, but people are going to be choosing between these two guys. And you mentioned the end zone targets for Mike Evans, too. That also gives him the edge for me. Now, I mean, granted, he's no Devontae Adams who gets 50 end zone targets per game around the goal line, but Evans, he gets used in that, you know, that, that black area, the, the green area, whatever you want to call it, around the goal line, five yards and in. He leads the team there too, right? In in Enzo targets around the goal line. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what his role has been this year. He's had so many stat lines this year where it's been like one for one for one, like one <laughs> yeah. catch, one yard, <laughs> one touchdown, <laughs> like basically occupying the role as the goal line back. And you think about those types of touches and touchdowns. Who is he taking away from? Oh, he's taking away from the running backs in those scenarios. He's taking it away from Leonard Fournette or Ronald Jones. So. From a touchdown perspective, equity standpoint, I, I really like Mike Evans in this particular game. And he's someone that I think that you can probably get a lot of leverage on in terms of the captain spot. I don't think Mike Evans is going to be a player that people are like, oh, yeah, Mike Evans captain. It's going to be, you know, mostly obviously the quarterback position, Mahomes, whether it's Mahomes, one of Mahomes' pass catchers, Kelsey and Hill or Brady. You know, I would say that Evans is probably going to have a lower ownership than all those guys. So as a player that has, you know, multi-touch on upside, he can obviously, you know, get a hundred yards receiving, hit that bonus. And look, that's the thing, you know, Brady goes to his guy in crunch time. He goes to Mike Evans. It actually pulled a statistic when I was looking at PFF grades. Again, this is a really cool thing that we can do. We can pull it by quarter. We can look at, you know, who is this player going by, you know, who is he going after in the fourth quarter? And for Brady, it's Mike Evans. Like that's his guy in the fourth quarter. And, I mean, we know this game's probably going to go to the crunch time, and I just anticipate, hey, man, if you have Mike Evans in the captain spot and you know, maybe he's not doing so hot, you know, just keep watching. Keep <laughs> watching till the fourth quarter, see what happens. 
Yeah, so right now in our Occupy model, we have Mike Evans as the sixth highest projected captain on DraftKings, just 8%, just 4% on FanDuel if you're feeling extra frisky. Um, I do want to talk about some other things, but I did want to pick your brain really quickly. You talked about the Chiefs limiting limiting production for opposing wide receivers. How much do you take that into account? Now, obviously, there's a lot of noise with uh, defense versus position matchups, but this one sticks out to me, you know, Defense first position matchups in the middle, you get a lot of noise. But a lot of times the endpoints are pretty predictive. The teams that are really good at defending one position or really bad at defending one position. And the Chiefs are on that one end. They're damn good at defending wide receivers for whatever reason it may be. On a full slate, we can take advantage of that and just ignore those receivers and those matchups. But on a showdown slate, how do you how do you balance the fact that Evans leads in opportunities but has a, a damn tough matchup? I think you still have to start with the opportunities because you look at the fact that you got to get the ball thrown to you first. Like that, that's like priority number one, because we've seen it before. We've seen, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to chase, you know, these fringier wide receivers when I find out, Oh, like their starting cornerback is down, you know, the starting stud cornerback is down just to find out that, Oh, well, they don't throw it. To, they don't throw the ball anyway. So <laughs> it didn't really matter in the, in the grand scheme of things because the opportunity ultimately wasn't there. And look, Mike Evans can go up, can go head to head with any type of cornerback. He's a big wide receiver. He can win, you know, jump balls. He can win at the top. So with Mike Evans, I think that it does, it goes, it is a case by case kind of scenario where yes, ideally it's not the greatest matchup, but again, it is the only game we have. And it's not like the Buccaneers, you know, give them Buccaneers defense has at times been decent against number one wide receivers as well. So you got to pick and choose. And again, if we're looking for leverage here, you know, trying to different differentiate our lineups a little bit, especially in a showdown slate, Mike Evans just really screams up to me as a, a guy that can do that. Yeah. I really like that. Really like that line of thinking. Let's flip it to the other side. You mentioned the Bucks defense briefly there at the end. The first time these teams met Tyree kill scored about 7,000 fantasy points in the first quarter. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on, on the matchup for the chiefs receivers here? Because the Bucks, they have one of the worst defenses on deep throws, right? Yes, yes. The Buccaneers have the PFF's 32nd graded defense on deep passing attempts this season, and we saw it play out last week. You know, MVS was all over him last week, and he obviously had a huge game. Um, but they've been better at stopping number one wide receivers. You know, they kind of they were able to limit Devontae Adams. They obviously we all saw what they did to hashtag slant boy Michael Thomas uh, two weeks ago. So they've been a lot better against number one wide receivers, and. Really, to me, I think you just got to keep going back to Travis Kelsey. Like, I, I understand the intrigue with Tyreek Hill and the fact that the guy scored, again, like, like you mentioned, like a bazillion fantasy points the last time he played the Buccaneers. But if this playoff run has kind of taught me anything at this point is that we can kind of throw those past matchups out the window because nothing has ever been the same, really, from the, the matchup prior to the upcoming matchup you know, that we see in the playoffs, necessarily, when, they, when those teams ultimately play each other again. So... For me to, again, people are going to point to Tyreek Hill's massive game, but I think the Buccaneers are going to try to make adjustments here. And look, everything that's telling me, you know, whether it's Kelsey's, you know, 28% target share, which is higher than Hill's, you know, the last since week 15, whether it's the fact that the Buccaneers play mostly zone coverage, or that's exactly what they've done because you can't play Patrick Mahomes in man coverage because it'll absolutely destroy you. Like you just can't do it. You have to play zone coverage against Patrick Mahomes. They played Tampa Bay the last time they played them 80% in zone. And, they kept him in check, and it was just the twenty percent of the time when they played man, when Patrick Mahomes absolutely destroyed them with Tyree <laughs> Kill. And under zone, it's Travis Kelsey that's seeing all the targets. You know, the tight end position when they're running a cover three or something like that, tight end just goes across the middle of the field and just absolutely sees is absolutely peppered with targets. He's a twenty eight percent target share versus zone zone defenses. Hill is at twenty two percent. Kelsey has five touchdowns. Hill is four. Kelsey has, Kelsey has like over a thousand yards against zone coverage this season. It's just, it's absolutely insane what this guy does. And I, I think that one point that is going to be talked about a lot is the fact that chiefs are without their two starting tackles. So we can probably anticipate that Mahomes might be under pressure a little bit more than we would like. And under pressure, it's Travis Kelsey. That again is his guy, 35% target share since week nine, when Mahomes has been under pressure. So for me, again, you know, we talked about Godwin versus Mike Evans. If you're not going to have both, you're probably going to have one. I prefer Evans in this spot. And for me, again, Hill is obviously super hard to fade. But, again, Travis Kelsey, the targets have just been there for him all season long. And against the zone coverage, I just really – it's screaming to me uh, another Travis Kelsey week. 
which pains me greatly because Kelsey's <laughs> going to be so popular. He's going to have incredible ownership, both of the captain, MVP, and flex spots. Going to be more popular than Hill. And now you're telling me he has uh, a layup matchup against a zone defense <laughs> with the starting tackles. It's, it's, it's absolutely disastrous for my bankroll probably. So um, let's talk about some of these running backs really quickly because I think this is one of the mo- more interesting uh, dynamics of this game with Fournette versus Ronald Jones. CEH versus Daryl Williams, maybe Le'Veon Bell if he's in there. Does any of your data around the red zone goal line looks tell us anything about who to target in this game? So last week we saw Daryl Williams and Clyde Edwards are there kind of work in tandem with each other as a 50-50 snap share percentage split. But when you look at the numbers in terms of what quarters they were playing, it was really Daryl Williams really only came in during garbage time. Mm-hmm. Like he came in during the fourth quarter. It was CH that was playing like the starter snaps through the first three quarters of the game. Um, so the carries ultimately planned out where it was Daryl Williams who got three carries inside the 10-yard line and Clyde edwards Lair got one carry inside the 10-yard line. So again, they're both seeing attempts in that type of range. And the same thing goes where we look at the, the Buccaneers. We're seeing Fournette get most of the carries inside the 10-yard line, but Ronald Jones also still gets carries since week 15. Fournette has six. Ronald Jones has three. That obviously includes some games that Ronald Jones missed due to injury, but For me, again, it just goes back to trying to get some leverage on the field. And look, so the the showdown master, as I like to call him from PFF, is Kevin Cole. He basically does a great showdown write-up piece every single week. And he he uses historical data, basically, looking at past matchups that match the upcoming game. Whether it's he looks at the point spread, he looks at the players that are playing in the game. And, you know, we talked about it on our Sirius XM show that I did every single Sunday night. He would come on, we'd be talk DFS showdown before the games would kick off. And literally every single night, he would always talk to me about Andrew. The value play is always the backup running back. Like he says it every single time. And yes, it doesn't work every single time. Like obviously it doesn't. But when it does work, like you have such a hit because people just don't want to play backup running backs. Like why, why in your right mind would you play, you know, Ronald Jones over Leonard Fournette? It doesn't really make a lot of sense because, you know, Fournette's been really good. And the fact that he's involved in the passing game, it makes a lot of sense to play him. But we also know at the same time that running back rotations can flip on a, a dime really quick. You know, Bruce Arians can get a feel like, no, I really want to go with Ronald Jones in this matchup. And again, we like to think that we can project their workload, you know, very confidently. But again, this is the Buccaneers backfield with Bruce Arians we're talking about. Yeah. You know, one that just a couple of weeks ago was Ronald Jones. Got to get him 20 touches a game. Got to get him 20 touches a game. So for me, especially Ronald Jones, who's like really, really cheap, you know, compared to Fournette on DraftKings. I think that Ronald Jones, he is someone that you can get double digit touch or you can get multi touchdown upside from him because he just has to get a carry inside the file. Let's say Fournette comes off the field. You know, after a big run or something, he catches the ball, he gets dinged up. Okay, now it's Ronald Jones. We know that the Chiefs don't have a good run defense. And something that the, the Buccaneers are doing, which doesn't make a lot of sense from a, you know, let's win the football per side of things, is they're running the football a lot on early downs. On like first and second down, they're just running the football. And then it's presenting a lot of third and longs for Tom Brady. Because again, running the football, you only get, you know, maybe like four yards. But the Chiefs defense the last couple of weeks has given up over five yards of carry against running backs on first and second on first down. So Bruce Arians is probably going to keep running the football on early downs. And that means we're going to see carries from Ronald Jones in addition to Leonard Fournette. And Ronald Jones has 23 carries over the past two weeks. So, I mean, we're looking at a guy who has going to guarantee to get double digit touches for sure. At least he's gotten them over the past two weeks, even the fact that he's been playing in a backup role and he has touchdown equity. And he also gives you that leverage because his, I have to imagine his ownership compared to Fournette is going to be, you know, a fraction of, of Fournette's ownership. So Ronald Jones, again, the backup running back has not failed me in a lot of spots. I've made a decent amount of money playing backup running backs in, in the showdown slate. So for me, I, I really like Ronald Jones in this spot. Yeah, that was you know that was my very initial gut reaction when the slate came out. The very initial gut reaction, but as I've started to dig a little bit more, as I, you know, I've lined up a couple guests for our shows. Um, I've talked to other people about this slate, and literally somehow every single time in the show notes or in the conversations, Ronald Jones comes up. And as a result, I think he's going to be probably one of the more popular players on the entire slate on DraftKings. <laughs> it's it's craziness to me that. You know, again, like you said, for all the reasons you just mentioned, he's a great play at just 2,200. 
Our initial projections have him at 33% overall projected ownership on DraftKings, which is <laughs> nuts for a number two running back. I think where the leverage could come, if for those out there playing both sites or just one side or the other, he's only 12% on FanDuel. And that, that's where you get the fraction of the ownership. Let me ask you this. If that's, if that's the case, right, if we get Ronald Jones as one of the more popular players, especially in high-dollar stuff and smaller field stuff, it sounds like he'll be really popular. Um, would you be more willing to take a chance on the Chiefs running backs? Because I, I kind of agree with you. I think that CEH is going to go overlooked just because the people are going to look at the split workload last week and not really dive in and see that he actually had a pretty big advantage when the game was competitive as opposed to Williams coming in in the fourth quarter. Because CEH at lower lower ownership than both Bucks running backs, I think, could get a pretty full workload if somebody's fully healthy. Yeah, that's why ownership projections are just so key. And that's something I didn't look at enough, you know, heading in, in my past DFS career. Didn't look at it enough, didn't use it enough. And it's really opened my eyes because you can think that this play is going to be low owned and that's why you're going to play it. And then you could be totally wrong and be like, wow, this was actually a really popular play. And I, I really didn't want to play this player at this ownership because that's something that, you know, you really need to take into consideration. So again, when, you know, Occupy Fantasy obviously has great projections when it looks looking at ownership. So that's something that you want to leverage. But yeah, I mean, if Clyde edwards helaire is going to be less owned than Ronald Jones and Fournette, I'm all for that, especially because he is, you know, the starting running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he's burned a lot of people throughout the season, you know, whether, you know, we have a lot of people kind of playing DFS maybe for the first time, you know, that's a lot of the field is going to be playing, you know, maybe they don't play CH because like, oh, I drafted this guy in my redraft league and he sucked, he got hurt, he didn't win me a fantasy championship, and I'm going to be all over him if, if, if your ownership projections kind of come to fruition there. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned uh, guys being higher owned than you initially think. There's literally nothing worse. Uh, granted, this, this is a very first world problem, but there's nothing worse in the world when you open up a DFS contest after locks and a guy is like twice as owned as you thought he would be. Absolute disaster. It ruins the entire slate. So well, it's funny that you say that because um, that's how it kind of was with Ronald Jones last week. Yes, like, dude. He, he was so was, popular um, last week, right? At least on FanDuel, yeah, so it, that, that it, was, it was nuts. Yeah, so that was something that I definitely because it was basically he was almost kind of split with Fournette, and if it was like, well, if I would known that, I would just play Fournette instead. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, dude, it was nuts. Yeah, he was like forty five percent on the Fanduel two game, and I was like, what? What is? I did not think that was going to happen. So I think we'll definitely see him pretty popular uh, in Sunday's matchup. So. <laughs> All right, Andrew, I want to close out the show here with some some general showdown strategy and maybe some specific uh, lineup tips for this particular slate. Um, any other trends? You talked about the backup running backs, but any other trends um, or any value leverage type spots that you're looking at for the Super Bowl? So I think that looking at just anyone that's not the the marquee names in the captain spot. So again, you you pointed out your top. I can assume that the top three are probably going to be Kelsey Hill and Mahomes, yeah. maybe Brady's in there, but I, I think that secondary options, like we've talked about. So Clyde Edwards Lair, like again, running back, multi touchdown upside. Again, Clyde Edwards Lair is an option there. Mike Evans is an option there. Um, if you want to get really crazy, you know, look going after some of these secondary Kansas City Chiefs options, like Hardman is is really sneaky when you can do it. I don't love the play, but Again, Edward Solaire, Brady, Mike Evans, I think are interesting captain spot. And the thing is, I think Brady probably will kind of go under own a captain just because people are going to want to play the Chiefs guys. Um, so I think that Brady's an interesting captain spot. It, at the same time, I think that makes Mahomes also kind of undervalued as a flex spot because I think people just kind of want to play him in the captain spot just because he's Mahomes. They don't want to figure out who's going to be the receiver he's going to throw to. They know that he's just the best quarterback on the planet. So Mahomes makes sense um, in the flex spot if you're not going to play him in the captain spot. Um, and then when it comes to the DSTs, again, nobody ever wants to play DSTs, but in terms of how much scoring we could see in this game, you know, we seeing, you know, a lot of teams coming in with great pass rushes. You know, the Chiefs have been a much better pass rush over the past couple of weeks. We obviously talked about how the Kansas City Chiefs are dealing with injuries on their tackles. And look, here's the thing with Mahomes. So at PFF, we record turnover worthy plays. So we're not looking at, okay, interceptions, things like that. We're actually looking at plays that, hey, this play should have been a turnover, which in theory is way more predictive of future turnovers rather than actual interceptions. So, you know, if a guy, you know, drops it, pick six, then we're going to, you're going to knock Mahomes for that because that's his fault. But we don't knock Mahomes if, you know, it goes off Tyree Kill's hands and it gets intercepted. You know, that doesn't count as a turnover worthy play for us. So Mahomes ranks fifth in the NFL in turnover worthy plays this season. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he does throw a pick or two in this game. The Bucks DST is super boomer bust. Like that's their that's the game they play. They blitz a lot. 
So they're willing to get burned for a long touchdown at the risk of, okay, well, we can get a pick six on this play. No one's going to want to play the Bucks DST because they're playing Mahomes, but we're looking for passing attempts. The Bucks are a run or excuse me, a pass funnel defense. Like the chiefs are probably not going to be able to run the football really at all against them. So we're going to see a lot of passing attempts. And again, the zone coverage also adheres to more passes for a guy like Clyde Witzer Lair because he's out of the backfield. He's not being, you know, manned up on a linebacker or things like that. So he also sees more targets in the against zone coverage as well. So again, talked about the running back, the backup running backs, Ronald Jones, but yeah, I think that if, if CH is, is, is really going low owned like this, I think that he's probably going to end up being one of my favorite guys to play. Yeah, if you learned anything from this show at all, it's that we're both on CEAs for the Super Bowl <laughs> slate. And hey, maybe we get a repeat of last year's Super Bowl slate where the Chiefs running back is the optimal captain uh, for, for the showdown. Yeah. So um, you did mention the turnover-worthy plays. I can't wait for Chiefs fans to be in your mentions about that made-up stat. <laughs> That's going to be incredible. Um, but I think the Bucks defense is, is a really interesting choice because, one, they're super cheap. If you're going that cheap, most people are playing Ronald Jones or maybe Gronk or somebody down there. But what I think just listening to you speak about their the boom bust nature of their defense this is a really good way to get unique on a massive showdown slate right there's like 600,000 people uh in the DraftKings showdown and absolutely no one is going to play Mahomes versus the Bucks defense like that that's anti correlation right no that doesn't make any sense yeah. but when you have a boom bust defense and they're blitzing all the time Mahomes can get there but if he makes one mistake all of a sudden the Bucks defense is in the optimal lineup so if you're playing the big GPP you're thinking about ways to get unique um, I could see that pairing get there just because of the nature of the, of the, the, of the, the defense. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, a Mahomes pick six is a is Yahtzee basically for the Bucks DST. Like you hit the, because that means, okay, now Mahomes has to go is now potentially down. Now they get another possession. So now he has to throw more. So again, this isn't something that we can just Im- immediately project and be like, oh yeah, he's going to throw pick six. But <laughs> right. if I had to bet on one defense throwing a, getting a pick six, it's probably gonna be the Bucks instead of the Chiefs. You know, Brady has been, you know, even though Brady throws the ball deep a lot and he threw three picks last week, you know, he's been relatively turnover, you know, he's been turnover savvy. He's been, he hasn't been turning the ball over really that often this season. And so, yeah, I think the Bucks DST, they're cheap. And if they're, I guess we need leverage off Ronald Jones now at this point. <laughs> I uh, gotta go with the Bucks DST. Yeah, and now you said Mahomes is gonna throw a pick six, so Chiefs fans are gonna be all over your ass this week. So. Hey, hey, Brady threw a pick six in the Super Bowl and he won, so why can't Mahomes? Let's go. There you go. See, there you go. So, um, Andrew, this was this was enlightening. Getting a lot of data from PFF and some of the stuff that you look at. Um, so I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your knowledge. Do you have any any final thoughts for this showdown slate? That uh, any final wisdom you can impart on our listeners? Man, I just think that, I mean, I liked Ronald Jones a lot, but now I don't like him as much. If, <laughs> of course, he's probably going to go off after we just all swap him out of our lineups. But I'd say, uh, you know, have fun with it. Of course, it's the Super Bowl. Enjoy it. It's the last game that we have this season. So live it up and, uh, you know, get a, little, get a nice little sweat going, you know. Nothing better than a Super Bowl sweat, let me tell you that. <laughs> Nothing better than oh, a yeah. Super Bowl sweat. <laughs> Speaking from the man himself, I, I mean, I put Edelman – hung up Edelman just for you, Brian, because I knew he's your guy. Dude, I noticed that, and I appreciate it. So, <laughs> Andrew, I appreciate it. Man, thank you. That That's awesome. Man. If for those of you who are listening to this podcast forum, uh, watch the video version on YouTube. There is an Edelman jersey hanging in Andrew's background. Um, Edelman's my guy. So uh, I, It was originally Brady, so I covered him up because I knew you had to fade Brady. <laughs> I remember, right? Because you, you faded It was because uh, you had Edelman in the captain spot, and you didn't play Brady. Yep, exactly. So we're going to run him back this time, and maybe we'll play Mike Evans in the captain without Brady and see how that works out for us. So, um, All right, for those of you, if you enjoyed Andrew's work, you can go follow him at Andrew Erickson underscore. Got the underscore at the end there. Um, it's in the show notes. It's also here on YouTube. You can you can see it. You can go read his work at Pro Football Focus. Lots of great work by Andrew. Um, and you can follow us at Occupy Fantasy. Follow me at Brian Jester FF. If you're listening to this in your favorite podcast app, just click subscribe. To get any latest episodes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and also click that subscribe button. So for Andrew, I'm Brian. Appreciate everyone listening and good luck in the Super Bowl. <laughs>